There's more to Moses than the Ten Commandments, and a lot of it is incredibly strange. If all you know about God's number one boy is Prince of Egypt or Charlton Heston in a wig, here are some lesser known facts about Moses. One of the most famous stories of Moses deals with his birth and how he escaped execution at the hands of a murder-happy pharaoh who was trying to reduce the Jewish population in Egypt. Moses' mother put the infant in a basket floating down the Nile, where he was ironically rescued and subsequently raised by the pharaoh's daughter. According to the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses from the Hebrew word Masha, meaning to draw out because she drew him out of the water. Because I drew you from the water, you shall be called Moses. 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 Now, if you're asking yourself why an Egyptian princess would give a mysterious river baby a Hebrew name, you're not alone. Most modern scholars suggest that Moses' name is probably of Egyptian origin, but Exodus includes a folk etymology to downplay the Egyptian background of the Hebrew hero. While no definitive origin for the name Moses has ever been determined, theories about the name include it coming from an Egyptian word meaning son of, while the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria connected it to the Egyptian word for water. Other theories range from the princess giving him a Hebrew name because she saw the baby was circumcised to Moses' own mother actually recommending the name when she worked for the princess as a nurse. The canonical scriptures skip from Moses' infancy to his young adulthood, leaving a lot of gaps concerning his life at the Pharaoh's palace to be filled in by popular imagination. The Jewish Encyclopedia records one of the best-known legends of the child Moses, which involves him snatching Pharaoh's crown. According to the legend, three-year-old Moses is sitting at the dinner table when he grabs the Pharaoh's crown and puts it on his own head. The Pharaoh's soothsayer worries that this is a sign that the child is the prophesied future liberator of the Jews in Egypt. Fortunately for young Moses, one of Pharaoh's counselors is actually the angel Gabriel in disguise, looking out for God's favorite boy. The secret angel proposes a test and sets out a piece of gold as well as a live coal in front of Moses to see which one he grabs, with the understanding that a hero of destiny and greatness would surely grab the gold. To make sure that won't happen, Gabriel supernaturally guides a child's hand to the coal. Being a baby, Moses obviously puts the burning coal in his mouth. Pharaoh's mind is set at ease that a prophesied hero would never do anything that dumb, and Moses' life is saved. Your familiarity with the life of Moses may mostly consist of the trip down the river and the parting of the Red Sea. What you may not remember, however, is that the inciting incident to Moses' role as prophet and deliverer of the people of Israel was a murder. Well, maybe a manslaughter, but either way, he killed a dude. In Chapter 2 of Exodus, the young adult Moses witnesses an Egyptian overseer beating a Hebrew slave. Thinking no one can see him, Moses kills the Egyptian and buries his body in the sand. The movie Prince of Egypt makes this look like an accident, but it was definitely premeditated. Later on, when Moses tries to stop a fight between two Hebrews, one of them mentions the killing. At that point, Moses knows the jig is up and books it out of Egypt and toward Midian. In Chapter 4 of Exodus, when the fugitive Moses encounters God in disguise as a shrubbery, he receives his call to action to become the great deliverer and lawgiver of the Israelite people. However, like any good hero, Moses tries to refuse this call, specifically noting that he's a bad choice because he's, quote, heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue. Much debate has ensued about what this description literally means, but the traditional explanation is that Moses had a speech disorder, most often understood to be stuttering. And you shall free my people from Egypt. Why me? A man clumsy with words. According to some, this stutter was the result of baby Moses putting that coal in his mouth, but it has also been suggested that God specifically chose someone with a disability to be a spokesman so that all the glory would go to God and not to his human representative. Sigmund Freud, on the other hand, thought maybe the boy raised in Pharaoh's household couldn't speak Hebrew at all, while others theorized that he spoke with a heavy Egyptian accent or simply spoke slowly. The most popular explanation, however, is the stutter, with various other verses used to back this up. God helps Moses get over his hesitation by telling him his brother Aaron can do the actual talking part. One of the strangest and most confusing incidents in the Bible occurs in chapter 4 of Exodus, when Moses is on his way back from Midian to Egypt with his wife Zipporah and their son in tow. While Moses and his family stop at an inn, God tries to kill Moses, probably. These three bewildering verses contain a bit of pronoun trouble. Someone definitely tries to kill someone, and God trying to kill off Moses makes the most contextual sense. Anyway, Zipporah stops God from killing her husband by cutting off their son's foreskin with a rock and throwing it at God's feet, and then tossing out an amazing one-liner, truly you are a bridegroom of blood. The traditional understanding is that God was angry at Moses for not circumcising his son according to God's covenant with Israel. In this regard, Zipporah's quick and dirty bris saved Moses' life, but her bloody bridegroom quip is still hard to parse. Still, hard to ask much more of your wife than that. Who makes you happy? You know.
Moses is the most important prophet in Judaism, and overall one of the most important dudes in all of the Bible. However, most modern biblical scholars say that the Torah wasn't actually written by Moses, or by any single person for that matter. Instead, they say it's a composite of multiple documents that were edited together. And in the earliest of these documents, it seems like Moses' role was even more prominent and had to actually be toned down by communities who liked Moses' brother, Aaron, better. He's my brother. Moses. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, in the earliest sources for the Torah, Moses did everything, and the only mention of Aaron was when he built the golden calf for the Israelites. The reason for this seems to be that the earliest sources were written by Moses fans, while later documents were written by those partial to Aaron, who featured him much more as Moses' helper and spokesman, as well as softening his culpability in the golden calf incident. Aaron's main role in tradition is that of the first high priest, which attributes to 90% of Aaron's references in the Bible. One of the things that most distinguishes Moses from other prophets is the personal nature of his relationship with God. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy says, No prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. According to the book of Exodus, this isn't a metaphor. After Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and brought them the law from Mount Sinai, he and God would hang out and chat. Exodus chapter 33 says, The Lord spoke to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. It seems God was disguising himself in these instances, however, because Moses asked to see God's full glory. And even though God says no man can see God and live, he figures out a compromise for his best bro. God agrees to reveal his full glory to Moses in order to encourage and reward him. But since the unvarnished image of God is deadly to the human mind, God says that Moses would have to stand in the corner facing the wall, and after God walked by, Moses could turn around and look at God's back. According to Exodus chapter 34, Moses' constant close proximity to the face of God had an unintended consequence on the prophet. His face became so radiant that you might even say it glowed, and this change actually made some people for hundreds of years think that Moses had horns. According to Haaretz, the Hebrew word for ray of light can also mean horn. So it's possible to interpret Moses' shiny face as a horned one if you take the less contextually appropriate translation, which unfortunately it was when St. Jerome translated the Bible into Latin. European Christians used this version until basically the Protestant Reformation, with the most notable cultural consequence of this being Michelangelo's famous sculpture of Moses in Rome's Basilica of St. Peter in Chains, which prominently features two horns on Moses' brow, perplexing thousands of modern tourists daily. One of Moses' most famous roles is as the liberator of the Jewish people, leading them out of Egypt, through 40 years of wandering the desert and into a land of milk and honey promised to them by God. As such, it might surprise people not deeply familiar with the story of the Torah that Moses himself never actually made it to the Promised Land. Of course, the walk from Egypt to Canaan is definitely not 40 years long. What happened is that when the Israelites got to the Promised Land, Moses' advanced scouts reported that the land was full of giants, which made the people too scared to enter. We have new laws preparing us for the Promised Land. If we are true to God, he will keep his promise. For their lack of faith, God cursed them to wander until that entire generation had died in hopes that the next generation would be more faithful. Once that time had passed, however, Moses found out that God wasn't going to allow him to enter Canaan himself. Instead, he died on a mountain within eyeshot of the Promised Land at the age of 120, and God himself buried him in a mystery grave. As pretty much the main dude of Judaism, naturally, there's more stories about Moses than most other prominent figures from the Hebrew Scriptures. The incident of Moses' death is no exception to this trend. However, there is an apocryphal book that might shine a supernatural light on the mystery of what really happened to Moses. The Assumption of Moses is a story so crazy that it didn't make it into the Bible. The story goes that God hid Moses' body so that the idol-prone Israelites wouldn't begin worshipping their leader's corpse the way they had the golden calf. Satan, on the other hand, thought this would be hilarious, so he tried to steal Moses' body. God, however, had placed the archangel Michael as the guardian of Moses' grave, and when the devil tried to uncover the body, Michael rebuked him, forcing him to flee. Unfortunately, as interesting as this story sounds, we don't have much more information on this divine tug of war over Moses' corpse. It's generally understood that the oldest alphabet we can verify the existence of is the Phoenician alphabet. For some Greco-Jewish historians, however, it's obviously Moses who invented the alphabet and then passed his version on to the Phoenicians. According to the Jewish Virtual Library, a widely quoted fragment by the historian Eupolemus claims, Moses was the first wise man, the first who imparted the alphabet to the Jews. The Phoenicians received it from the Jews and the Greeks from the Phoenicians. Also, laws were first written by Moses for the Jews. Inventing the idea of letters and the very concept of law is pretty big. The historian Artipanos went a step further, claiming Moses was the figure known to the Greeks as Musias, the teacher of the great musician Orpheus. 
And oh yeah, he was also the deity known to the Greeks as Hermes and the Egyptians as Tote, a legendary figure who taught the alphabet, science, and mathematics to humankind, so he's kind of a big deal. Despite Moses' role in the development of three different major world religions, most modern scholars generally reject his literal existence as a historical person, though many accept that the legend of Moses may be based on certain details from the life of a Moses-like historical person. One reason that Moses is considered to be more legend than fact is that some details of his life can be seen echoed in the stories of a number of other legendary figures. The most prominent of these repeated motifs is the story of the baby Moses being rescued from the river. According to the Ancient History Encyclopedia, the Mesopotamian king Sargon of Akkad wrote a fiction-heavy autobiography in which he related that he was born the illegitimate child of a priestess who sent baby Sargon in a basket down the Euphrates River, where he was rescued and eventually became a conquering king. Likewise, the story of the Hindu hero Karna and even the Greek story of Oedipus follow the same basic pattern. Hey, if you're gonna plagiarize, why not steal from the greatest story ever told? Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite biblical figures are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.